Hello everyone and welcome back to an L582 modeling and control of electric machines and drives. Last time we were talking about how to derive the three phase induction motors torque speed characteristics. Okay. And we have lined it out with this curve that is having the relationship between the motor's developed torque and the mechanical rotor speed or slip and it was like that okay and I've investigated everything here we said this point represented the synchronous speed and this point represented the pullout torque which is a, that means the maximum torque the machine can deliver by the way we call that the torque capability okay tells you how much torque that the machine is capable of producing because that is the maximum torque the machine can ever have okay but like we said last time it does not mean that the machine just keeps producing this amount of torque all the time the machine produces as much torque as the load demands okay so that's the capability of the machine it's not the actual torque that is just developing it develops as much torque as the load requires but yeah, those it's the capability of the machine. So the machine is capable of producing torque up to the pullout torque, but it's actually producing torque for the load. So this is the SPO, the slip at the pullout torque. So that the value for the slip corresponding to this uh, torque, which is the maximum torque, like we said. At the synchronous speed, the slip equals zero. And at here, the mechanical speed equals zero that's the beginning of the curve okay and that's corresponding to a slip equals one okay so that this point represents your starting torque that the torque that the motor uh, capable of producing at zero speed okay that means it's at the starting and that's a very important um, value to have for any kind of a motor because you know at the starting the motor has to develop as much torque so if you remember uh, the motor torque equals the load torque plus the friction torque which is b omega plus the acceleration torque which is j d omega by dt okay so if we just forget about those they're not as much compared to the load torque itself so you're just dealing with the motor torque equals the load torque a little bit higher than the load torque to just by the friction and acceleration torque so we're talking about the starting condition so this as starting so that we call it the starting torque so the starting torque has to be higher than the load torque okay because it has also to accommodate for the friction and the acceleration especially the acceleration torque appears at the beginning because if you remember the acceleration torque equals j d omega by dt so it appears with a change in speed and uh, during the starting period the speed changes okay so if you look at the speed of any kind of a motor with time it will look like that it will start from zero and start accelerating and it will just go to steady state okay so this period here we call it the starting period okay it is the um, period that the motor takes for the speed to reach its steady state so this we call it the steady state speed okay once you reach the steady state speed and now the speed is constant you don't have this term anymore because now this variation in the speed equals zero okay but at the beginning you still have this term because you still have change in the speed at so this starting period so actually the starting torque has to be higher than the loose torque okay otherwise the machine will stall stop it cannot start okay if it cannot produce higher torque than the the load torque and also to accommodate for the friction and acceleration torque the machine will not rotate at all okay it will just keep drawing a very high amount of current because we also remember the current just goes high at the beginning at the starting like we said before if you remember so the current then here was time all look like something like that okay so I'm here talking about the RMS value of the current or something 
So it will just go very high, something like that, and I will just oscillate and go to a steady state, okay? So the current goes uh, very high at the beginning, we call this the starting current, I starting, okay? So if the starting torque is not higher than the load torque, the machine will keep just drawing this amount, this big amount of current until it burns down, or at least it's just being tripped off by the circuit breaker protection. Okay guys, so the whole point is the machine has to develop higher torque at the starting than the load torque, the friction and the acceleration torque, otherwise the machine will refuse to start from the beginning. That's why this value, the starting torque, is a very very important value to determine for any kind of a motor. It's corresponding to a step equals 1, then you can calculate it using the equivalent circuit by placing the step equals 1 and just calculating the current, and from it you can calculate the torque as usual. Okay guys? Like I said last time, if you remember, the rated torque of the machine is a little bit less than this. This is the rated torque. Like I said last time, the pull-out torque or the maximum torque does not equal the rated torque. The rated torque of the rated of the machine is designed to work at all the time, and it's a little bit less than the pull-out torque. So the machine actually is capable of producing a little bit higher torque than the rated torque, but not all the time, it's just for a small amount of time. Otherwise, you just sacrificing the machines winding okay guys so how much actually the machine is producing torque it depends on the load so you have the load torque like that maybe or actually let me draw it a little bit down here also to be less than the starting torque because that's how it should be so if this your load torque so this point, the interaction between the load torque and the curve of the motor, the torque speed curve, we call it the operating point. And that's actually, if you go here, you will find the actual speed and slip that the motor is working at just right now, okay? So like I said, this curve represents the capability of the machine, but it doesn't mean it's just producing as much torque as the pull-out torque all the time, or any kind of time. It's just responds to the load change okay guys so here is the whole point of this if you have a motor like that and that is the speed and slip obviously and you will have a torque speed characteristic like that okay guys so if you have a load torque like this guy here that is T load 1 it will have a speed like this, N motor 1. But if this load goes up, even here or something, now the speed will drop down to this value. Okay? Like I said last time, if T load 2 higher than T load 1, that means you have an increase in the load, the speed will drop down. N M2 will be less than N M1. Okay? But what about if we don't want the speed to change? Or if you, we want to actually have another speed at all? Imagine that this motor, the three-phase induction motor, is just driving an elevator in some sort of a building, and you're inside the elevator, okay? That means the more persons inside the elevator, that means more torque of the load, that's how it's translated. More persons inside the elevator means more load in your shaft, and according to this principle we're talking about, the speed of the machine will drop down. And it's not convenient because you need the elevator to keep moving at the same speed it's designed to. Otherwise, it will not actually be as a good elevator, okay? And you need the elevator to have a certain pattern to start from the floor you are in in a small speed and then it goes higher and higher and then before it stops, the speed goes down again just to make it more convenient for the passengers inside the elevator. But if you just leave the motor like this, it will just respond to the load. So if the just one person inside the elevator, it will be very fast. It's not convenient at all, it would not like it. If there is 10 persons inside the elevator, it will be very small, so the, the speed will be very small. That means the elevator will be very, very slow. It's not convenient at all. Okay, so actually we cannot leave the motor like this in most of the application. Otherwise, you're dealing with an, some sort of industrial application while the load does not change at all. So you can just, it's okay, it's 
some sort of a load applied to the motor shaft all the time so it will have some sort of a speed all the time and that's it but if you're dealing with a load that's changing you cannot leave just the speed to respond to the change of the load with its nature like this because it will not be convenient for most of the loads that's why we need to introduce a very very important principle here we call it speed control of three phase induction motor now we don't want the speed just to follow the load so the whole point is naturally I mean without control the speed follows the load okay so the more the load the less the speed okay but it's not as convenient so we want to control it now we have to just control the speed to make it just does not follow the load but follow whatever we want it to do so with control we can determine the amount of speed required irrespective of the load okay so you don't mind the load and just choose the speed you want actually it will not that easy or there will not be open um, choice so you can pick whatever speed you want okay there will be limitations but the whole point is we can now control the speed not just leave it naturally to follow the load okay guys how we do this there is plenty of methods and we will just try to make sure we understand um, the most important methods of those okay guys so I'm gonna just call this speed control um, methods okay so yeah make this here okay guys so now I'm gonna investigate with you the methods of speed control okay so number one here is changing the um, resistance added to rotor circuit obviously for wound rotor type okay remember the last lecture when you talked about that if you have a wound rotor machine you can add an external resistance to the machine's uh, rotor winding using the slip rings and brushes okay so added to so uh, yeah I make it added resistance to rotor circuit via the slip rings and brushes okay remember when we talked about the wound rotor type that you can access the rotor circuit and actually that's the advantage of this kind of it otherwise we will use the square cage type without thinking so the square cage type is much much convenient in terms of it does not need almost any maintenance it's very rigid mechanically so it can just handle heavy loads on high speeds without being very worried about it but if you use a wound rotor machine now that means you have regular winding inside slots and those winding inside the slots connected to a slip ring and you have brushes connected to them and you have and you know before we talked about it the brush sets and all those brushes are just a very big headache for us we don't like it because the brushes keep deteriorating all the time and you'll have sparks with them and so you will need frequent maintenance so we will not use the wound rotor type unless we are forced to and why are forced to mainly for control purposes like here so you can actually add external resistance to the rotor circuit for control okay and also remember the last lecture we talked about it adding more resistance to the rotor will increase the stability of the machine remember when you said the slip at the pull out torque that equals r2 over um, square root of r7 square plus 
x2 plus x7 and square okay so like we said here if we increase r2 by adding a resistance so it's now r2 plus r add so we have increased this r2 so this slip of the power torque will increase okay and this will increase the um, stability of the machine but not just the stability look with me here uh, the torque speed characteristics of the machine okay now I have a torque speed characteristics like this if you just have R2 with not any addition okay guys but if you add resistance now you increase the slip of the pull out torque so the slip of the pull out torque originally was here that is SPO1 make it or just SPO without any addition for resistance but if you add the resistance now the torque speed curve of the machine will be just shifted like that okay now that is the new SPO slip of the polar torque call it two or something okay so that's why I'm saying now you have much stable machines because like we said before for here that is just the stability zone for this motor but now with this addition now we have much wider stability zone that means you can increase the torque for much higher values without just being uh, or just that is the stability region now you have a wider stability region to just have change in the load up and down a little bit without just being worried to just exceed the pull out torque and just go into the unstable zone on the machine now enter the breakout zone actually breakdown sorry okay so that's what we said last time but now look that is the whole point of here it's not just increasing the stability range okay so this increases the stability range okay but it's not just increasing the stability range okay just look with me for a second here like we said before what actually was the actual amount of torque that the machine now is just developing like we said it depends on the load yeah so let us just see if the load equals this value like we said before so here the load torque okay so like we said here was your just operating point if you just have r2 without any added resistance so the speed was here and m1 okay and it have a slip equals slip one but now you have another torque speed curve it is the same motor but you have created another torque speed curve by playing with the internal structure of the machine by adding resistance to it okay so it's the same same machine but it's now having an updated version of the torque speed characteristics okay guys so like here now with added resistance that is the red curve which is corresponding to r2 plus r add now you have a new operating point here and that means now the speed is just here in m2 it's corresponding to another slip value which is 2 see what's happening we have now we were having r2 okay we have intentionally increased it and now it equals r2 plus r add the corresponding speed for just r2 was in m1 now you have another speed which is in m2 see what i'm saying here okay guys so what happens here if you increased r2 by adding resistance to it that will just result in a reduction in the speed see what i'm saying guys it is the same load you didn't change the load here the load is still the same but now the machine is working at less speed so that's what I'm saying. Now we have control over the speed. The speed is not just naturally corresponding to the load. With the increase in the load, the speed just drops. No. Now the load is still the same. It does not increase, but the speed has been reduced because we have added resistance to the rotor circuit. So now you can just play with it and see how much resistance you need to add 
to have the reduction you want in the speed. Obviously, it will be different from a motor to a motor because each motor has different torque speed characteristics, depends on its own um, equivalent circuit parameters. Okay, guys? So that is the whole point of this. Add more resistance to the rotor winding and your speed will drop down. Easy as that. Okay? So that's what I'm saying. With increasing R2, now the speed has been reduced for the same load. Okay, guys? So that's a very, very good thing to just deal with. Let me just talk to you about the pros and cons of this method. Adding resistance to the rotor circuit. Okay? The pros here, go number one and lock at it. Okay? The pros here is while it controls the speed, it also increases stability range. Okay, like we said before, if you add resistance to the rotor circuit, you're not just controlling the speed, but also the stability range will increase. Okay? We know this before. Number two, and that's a very important thing to have, is it increases the starting torque. Look here. That was the starting torque one without any addition of rotor resistance. Now that is the starting torque two. Okay? So now you have actually increased the starting torque. Like we said before, the starting torque is a very important value to have. The more starting torque you have, the better motor you have, especially if it has heavy loads attached to it. Okay? So the motor needs higher torque at the starting, otherwise it will not be able to start at all. So with adding resistance to the rotor circuit, actually it increases the starting torque. And by the way, keep that in mind. It is the only method, okay, to increase or, okay, just let me not just jump you with this now because actually it will confuse you. It will just, we will go back to just have more about this when you're talking about the starting methods, maybe a couple of lectures ahead. So I'll be talking about this much more in details. So don't bother yourself with so much in depth about it now. For now, just have it in your mind, just increasing the rotor resistance, it increases the start and torque of the machine. And that's very good to have. Okay, guys? So here's your pros. But what about the cons? Okay. So it's obvious to have in mind is adding more resistance increases the copper losses in the router, okay? And this, in definition, reduces the efficiency. So adding more resistance is not good. It increases the copper losses and this reduces the motor efficiency and we don't like that, okay? Okay, the other thing to keep in mind, and that's a game thing, okay, so the slip increases with adding more resistance. Seen here? Okay. Like I'm seeing here, though the slip value corresponding to um, the first point, which no addition in the rotor resistance. And now this is slip two, okay? The slip increases, okay guys? Because obviously the speed has just dropped. So the whole point is the slip increases with adding more resistance. The slip two is higher than slip one. This with R added and this 
without our edit. And why we hate the increase in the slap? Remember what I said before, if you remember we just derived all what you said that the peak copper losses in the router equals the slap times the air gap power. Have this in mind, that's very important. So if this slip goes up, the copper losses in the router goes up with it. And again, more copper losses means less efficiency. Okay guys? So the increase in the slip means increase in the copper losses in the router and this reduction in the machine's efficiency. We don't like this. Okay? So keep that in mind. Why this actually happens here? Because we'll need this when you just go more. Okay, guys? The whole point is, log at me again with the torque speed characteristics. Okay? Uh, the slip or the motor torque. That is with R2. And this one with R2 plus R add. The whole point is, the synchronous speed is still the same. So this shifting that happens here to the left for this curve with the addition and the rotor resistance, yeah, it just helps you with the reduction, so the, the loot torque, so the speed has been reduced from here to there. But because the synchronous speed is still the same, this shift comes with the cost of increasing the slip. Okay, guys, that's what I'm saying. And this will keep appearing with us with all the methods where we just don't play with the synchronous speed. So here we don't play with the synchronous speed. Remember, the synchronous speed equals 120 F over P. So as long as the frequency constant and the number pole is constant, the synchronous speed will remain constant. And why the synchronous speed remains constant is just like what you've seen here. Whatever you're trying to do anything to control the speed, so with any reduction in the speed, the slip will increase. And we don't like this, because the, like we said, an increase in the slip increases the copper losses in the rotor and this reduces the machine's efficiency. Okay, guys? So again, the thing to keep in mind. But still, if you just have another probe for this, it's the advantage, it is a simple method. It is just a resistor and you add to the router circuit and that's it. Okay guys? So yeah, if you just need some sort of a simple method and you have a round router in your hand, you can just use this method. But keep in mind that you're sacrificing the efficiency a little bit. So again, it's an engineering problem. Work it out and see if it is good for you and it also depends on your application. Okay guys? And also to have for the cons of this method, it's again obvious it can be used only with wound router type induction motor. Okay? So yeah, you cannot do this with the square cage because you know the square cage you cannot access the router circuit at all, you cannot add any resistance to it. And obviously, the vast majority of three-phase induction motors out there are square cage type. Okay, so actually this method will not help us much. But we now understand it. Okay. Let me jump to another method. Number two, which is control the supply voltage okay it's obviously the stator supply voltage because you know for yeah for three phase induction motor we add in the supply to the stator and the router gets its voltage by induction from the stator okay guys and why will this happen if we just can control the voltage of the machine actually how can you actually from the beginning control the voltage of the machine most of the time using u2 transformer okay this is what we have in our lab by the way you remember you have an auto transformer to use so the auto transformer you'll have just one coil like that 
and here is the supply voltage and you have a tap over it and you get from this tap to the motor so this going to that is the voltage going to the motor and this tap actually can be controlled to go up and down and this will get you more voltage or less voltage so now you can control actually the voltage going to your motor if you use some sort of an auto transformer like that okay but while the control the voltage will happen to us okay keep in mind something very important just before we say anything that this method can only be used to reduce voltage compared to the rated value okay So naturally the motor guys works at the rated voltage, it just have the voltage from the supply, from the grid, okay? That's for here, North America it's 208 volts for the low voltage application, for low voltage grids it have 208 volts, 60 hertz. And the motor actually works at this rated value. So what I'm saying, you can control the voltage, you go into the motor, I'm not saying you can increase it because it is already working at the rated value, if you increase the voltage you're burning the winding, okay guys? So you cannot do anything here but to reduce the voltage. You cannot increase it. Keep that in mind. Okay? Why? Because the motor it just naturally works at the rated value. Okay? Because the motor works naturally at rated voltage, okay? So you cannot increase the voltage because you cannot increase the voltage over the rated value. It's forbidden. You're burning the winding. Okay? So that's the whole point. You can reduce the voltage a little bit if you want. Now what will happen if you try to reduce the voltage? Okay? Reduce stator voltage. Okay? Again, we go to our faithful friend, the torque speed curve. Okay, so that is our original curve like this. That is at V1. That is the stator voltage at the beginning, okay? If you reduce the voltage, let me know the voltage is just working at V1 dash, which is less than V1, okay? So now your torque speed curve will just plot like this. That is at V1 dash. It has been reduced, pushed down like that. Again, the same thing. Now look, if I have a low torque at here, so for the first voltage, which is the rated voltage, it is going to a speed NM1 at slip S1. Now you are working at another operating point, and now the speed has been reduced to NM2, and the slip has been increased to S2. Okay, so the reduction in the voltage reduces your torque speed curve. Why? Because go back to the torque speed curve of the machine. At equal 3 V7 squared over R7 plus R2 over S squared plus X2 plus X7 squared R2 over S omega S. That is the derived torque speed equation for the three-phase induction motor we derived the a couple of lectures before. Okay. So if you remember, V7 equals so this V7, okay. It's just so the whole point is like we said here, if we reduce the voltage, so V1 has been reduced to V1 dash. Obviously, the 7 voltage will be reduced because remember V7 equals Z1 multiplied by some constants from the machine's equivalent circuit. So the reduction in the V1 will be directly translated into the reduction to the 7 voltage, and this from the equation, like I said here, if this goes down, the torque goes down with this. So the motor torque actually goes down, and that's why we're saying here that the torque speed curve has been pushed down, all of it just went down. 
okay? And that's why, like we said in here, at the same load torque, the reduction in the voltage will be translated into reduction in the speed, okay? So for the same load torque, T load, okay? If the voltage of the stator went down, the speed of the machine goes down with this, and this means the slip goes up here. Why? Again, because the synchronous speed is still the same, because we didn't change the synchronous speed. We didn't change the frequency of the number of poles, so any reduction in the speed would be translated into increase in the slip. Okay? Remember, guys? Because, yeah, the slip equals ns minus nm over ns. So the slip basically depends on this difference between the mechanical speed, the rotor speed, and the synchronous speed of the machine. So if the synchronous speed kept constant, any reduction in the speed will be translated into increase in the slip. Okay, guys? That's what I'm saying here. So yes, if you reduce the voltage applied to the machine's terminal, the state of terminal, if you reduce the voltage, the speed will be reduced for the same load. So again, you can control the speed without playing with the load. So the load's still the same, but we manage to reduce the speed, and that's what we want here. Yeah? But again, it's just not without cost. Okay? What is this cost? Let's look again, look again at the pros and cons. Okay? So if you look at the pros, of this um, method, okay. So it is simple compared to other methods. You just need some sort of an auto transformer and put it there and change the voltage. Easy. It's not very complicated, even to handle. Okay, it's simple in principle, but it has a lot of cons here. Okay, number one, the auto transformer you're dealing with here is another equipment. Okay, that means it needs money, it's expensive. Also, it needs maintenance and needs an installation. It's an equipment. You need to install it, you need to maintain it, you need money to buy it, money to keep it maintained, and all that stuff. Okay? So it's not something very good to have an additional equipment just for control. But you're forced to it most of the time. Okay? Number two. Like we sit here as, as the synchronous speed is fixed, okay, the reduction in speed is translated to increase and slip and like we said increasing the slip means increases in the rotor copper losses and this means reduction in the pre um, the efficiency sorry so we don't like this okay but again nothing comes without cost the other problems here look at the torque speed curve and what we did with it the black one is your original and the blue one is your new one the starting torque of the first one was here, that is now down here. So you actually reduce the starting torque, and that's not good at all. Like we said, we like the starting torque of the machine to be high. So it has been now reduced. Let me call it just, yeah. Okay. Again, look at here. That was the pullout torque at the beginning. Now it is your pullout torque. Also, the pull-out torque has been reduced. And that means the capability of the machine went down. The machine is not as capable as before. Okay? So 
So before, let us say that the machine can capable of producing 100 Nm, and now it cannot produce more than 80 Nm or something. So if you have a heavy load that is very close to the machine's maximum load, now you cannot even handle this amount of load. So this method cannot be used with very heavy loads. Okay, that's the whole principle. Keep that in mind. The reduction in the voltage actually breaks down the machine's capability even more. Like you see in here, lock. The machine's torque directly related to the square of the voltage actually. So if you reduce the voltage, say to a half, or just by an order of two, you're reducing the torque by an order of four because this is squared here. So I'm saying, so we don't like most of the time to play with the voltage like this. Okay, so that is the third thing to have in mind here, that the torque of the machine directly related to the square of the voltage. Okay, the square of it. That means reducing voltage by an order of 2, for example, reduces the torque capability by order of 4. And that's totally undesirable. You're sacrificing the machine's capability, okay? So for here, by reducing the voltage, okay, the voltage of the machine goes down, the starting torque goes down, and the pullout torque goes down, like we've seen here. That means the machine's torque capability both at starting and running conditions has been severely reduced. So actually this method cannot be used with heavy loads, okay? So you can just use this if you have a light load, not a very heavy load on your motor. Otherwise, because like we've seen here, reducing the voltage reduces the machine's capability by much. Okay, guys? Okay. Like we said in those previous two methods, adding resistance to the rotor circuit and reducing the voltage applied to the stator terminal using an auto-transformer, the whole point, yes, you can reduce the, the speed, you can control the speed, okay? But both of them, we do not change the synchronous speed of the machine. So any reduction in the speed, like we said, translated into increase in the slip, and this increases the copper losses in the rotor, and this kills your machine's efficiency. We don't like that. So what about if we now play with the synchronous speed of the machine? Can we actually change the synchronous speed rather than just playing with all that stuff? Okay. So these methods, I'm just starting with method three, let's control the synchronous speed. Okay. What, as you know, the mechanical speed of the machine equals 1 minus s, which is the slip, multiplied by the synchronous speed. So like you see in here, if you kept the slip constant, any change in the synchronous speed directly changes the mechanical speed, and that's what we want. We need to control this mechanical speed. So if you can control the synchronous speed, that means you're controlling the mechanical speed. Okay, guys? Now we can play with it in both directions. If the synchronous speed goes up, you will get the mechanical speed up. If the synchronous speed goes down, you're getting the mechanical speed down. So it's not like the two methods before where we do anything but reducing the speed. Now we can even increase it. Okay? How we do this? 
by controlling the synchronous speed. So how we can control the synchronous speed? Look at the equation for calculating it. It's 120 F over P. So like you can see, you have two parameters you can control here. Number one, control number of poles or control the frequency of stator voltage. Like I've seen before guys, the synchronous speed is the speed of the magnetic field. Okay? And it's determined by this equation, 120 F over P. So if you wanna control the synchronous speed, easy as that, you can control the number of poles or control the frequency. Okay? What actually we will have if we controlled the synchronous speed? Remember again the torque speed characteristics. If this was your torque speed characteristics at the first synchronous speed. Remember? Here is your synchronous speed. That is the synchronous speed. I'm now calling it 1. If we reduce the synchronous speed, now this torque speed characteristic will look like this. That is 2. And now that is your new synchronous speed because you have just changed the synchronous speed. Let me just here, we reduced it. So if we control the synchronous speed to be less than this 2 to be less than 1, that means we have reduced the synchronous speed. See what's the difference here, guys? The whole torque speed curve has been shifted left, even with the synchronous speed point, with the intersection with the horizontal axis. Not like before with all these methods, remember? Lock here, it is one synchronous speed because we didn't change the frequency or the number of poles, so the synchronous speed remains constant. And even here, with adding resistance, it's also one synchronous speed. But now, if we reduce the synchronous speed itself, this point will be moving here, like this. And why will this happen? Again, look, if we have the torque, the low torque, like this, okay? That was the operating point with the first synchronous speed lock that is an M1. And now that is the operating point with the other one that is an M2. See what I'm meaning here, guys? That is the difference between the mechanical speed and synchronous speed for the first case. And this is the difference for the mechanical speed and synchronous speed for the second case. See what I mean? Now you have changed the speed. Now with this, the mechanical speed had once down, yeah. But what about the slip? The slip is kept constant or almost constant. Because again, the slip equals ns minus nm over ns. So you're just looking at this difference between the synchronous speed and the mechanical speed. By shifting the synchronous speed itself from NS1 to NS2, you have just now, this difference is this difference at the beginning and this difference of now, it's small. Compare it like before when you have not controlled the synchronous speed. It will look like this. So if this is the loop torque, now, this is NM1 and this is NM2, but the synchronous speed for them is fixed. So shifting this mechanical speed to here comes at cost that there is a very, very big difference between it and the synchronous speed, and that means more and more increase in the slip. So our goal is shifting the synchronous speed, reducing the synchronous speed itself, so you keeping the difference between it and between the mechanical speed small so you're keeping the slip small okay guys are keeping the slip constant or more constant we're talking about at small value so small slip means small copper losses in the rotor circuit and this means higher efficiency so you have control the speed you have reduced the speed but without sacrificing the efficiency like we said before.
Okay, guys. So that's the whole point. We need to control the synchronous speed. But how we can actually control the synchronous speed? Like we said, even by controlling the number of poles or controlling the frequency of the stator. So let me say, or just start by saying, number A here control the number of poles, okay? The number of poles, guys, is determined by how you wind the machine, actually. It is related to how you wind the machine, okay? So to change the number of poles, you have two methods to go with, okay? The first one is using two separate sets of winding with different number of poles and switch between them okay so that means you have on the same stator two different winding sets on top of each other on the same slot on the same machine but one of them say has two poles and the other has four poles so the first one for example has two poles so at 60 hertz supply the synchronous speed of it will be 3600 rpms and the other set has four poles so again at 60 hertz the synchronous speed will be 1800 rpms okay so you have two separate winding sets one with two poles and other four poles and you can choose to work with this or with this by connecting this or connecting this to supply okay and just by switching between them you're just controlling the synchronous speed by a vast big amount of reduction or increase okay but to keep that in mind that means it will or you have a problem here because you have two sets of winding so two separate sets of winding means much heavier machine okay because rather than just having one winding set you now have two separate winding sets so yeah you can have a little bit of control but you know your machine will be much bulky and very heavy so it will be much heavier and bulkier okay even have very large volume okay the other way just to control the number of poles also is changing how the different coils are connected to for a winding using sets of switches so like we said before a winding so the winding of phase a or phase b or phase c it's not just one coil guys it's different coils and connected together in series okay so these winding if you have them all the terminals out if you have switches to just connect them together you can change these connections to have different number of poles okay but like I'm just saying here it is more complicated requires more switches and more vulnerable to short circuit faults 
That means you have all the connections of all the coils accessible and you just play with them, connect this to this and this to that, and this will chain number poles, but it will be just very messy. That means you can make mistakes and they will be more vulnerable to all short circuits and all that stuff, okay? But again, it's doable. Everything comes with a cost. So actually changing the number of poles will help you change the synchronous speed and that will give you much help here. But actually, it's not the way we prefer, because like you've seen here, you need to play with the winding itself, and this comes with a very big headache, okay? So actually, we don't go with this most of the time. We like to go with the other method most of the time, which is controlling the frequency of the voltage, okay? It's much more convenient and much more flexible also, okay guys? Because both of those methods are not flexible. That means most of the time you're just changing between two speeds, at most three speeds. You cannot go beyond this. But if you need more flexibility of the control to go whatever speed you want, you have to go with the frequency control. And that is the most preferable one and we'll be talking about it in much, much detailed next class. Okay? So thank you guys so much for joining me today and I'll be very happy to have you with me next time.